Hi, my name is Edward Mariani Squire and I teach economics in the School of Business at Western Sydney University. This video is designed to just go through the absolute bare bones minimum requirements necessary to understand a supply demand model. So let's get to it. What we're talking about here when we talk about a market is in essence simply this. There are buyers of a product, people who are willing and able to purchase something, uh, and then there are another group of people who are willing and able to sell something uh, that they possess. These two groups interact with each other such that they can agree on prices where they are willing and able to exchange quantities of the goods and services on offer so that everyone feels better off as a result of the exchange. This is the essence of a market. What we're going to be looking at is a very particular kind of model called the demand supply curve model. It's a theoretical tool um, rather than a complete description of real world markets, you know, in the, the flesh and blood, gory mess of real markets. This is a, a theoretical representation. So it abstracts from a lot of the details that you might find interesting about particular markets and focuses on a few key elements to try and make sense of how prices might be determined in a competitive market environment. So here the kind of model that we're going to look at is particularly good at or most useful for examining perfectly competitive or purely competitive markets. So what do we mean by that? Well, a perfectly competitive market is one which is characterized by the following features. First, there are very, very many buyers and sellers. There are, the implication here is that there's so many buyers and sellers that each individual buyer and each individual seller is relative to the market as a whole, relative to the group, tiny and insignificant. They make no impact on the overall outcomes of markets as individuals. As groups, of course, they do. But if we singled out a particular individual buyer or seller and we decided to you know, hire a hitman and knock them off, then the market as a whole wouldn't really notice. There's another characteristic is that from the perspective of the consumers, perspective of the buyers, the products being sold by each individual seller is identical. So what's being produced or sold by, by seller A is exactly the same as the product being sold by seller B, same as seller C, and so on and so forth. There are no barriers to entry or exit from the market for either buyers or sellers. So it costs nothing to enter the market to participate in it, <clears throat> and it costs nothing to leave the market. And we say that the buyers and sellers have perfect knowledge, which, which means that uh, if there were any change in circumstances, then each buyer and seller would know about that change instantaneously and would be able to react to it in a rational way instantaneously. In the case of a purely competitive market, we say that all of the above assumptions are hold, hold except for the last one. We say that for a purely competitive market, there's many, many buyers and sellers, all of the sellers are selling exactly the same thing from the perspective of the buyers. There's no barriers to entry to exit. However, the 
each individual buyer and seller doesn't have perfect knowledge. That is, a change in the market may occur and the participants in the market won't necessarily realize that change has occurred at the moment that it occurs. Rather, they discover it over time and then react to it rationally. So there's an adjustment period through time as buyers and sellers realize that some change or other has occurred in the marketplace. But in the end, we would say that in both cases, whether we're talking about a perfectly competitive market or a purely competitive market, that the buyers and the sellers, crucially, have no market power. That is, they are price takers. As individuals, they are price takers. They simply accept whatever the market price is. They don't have the capacity to alter the market price to their own advantage. That is, they have no market power. Okay, now we've said this model is about supply and demand. Well, we have a, an abstract definition here, and it's this. The maximum quantities of X, whatever X happens to be, that buyers are willing and able to purchase at various corresponding prices in some time period T. Caterus paribus. So caterus paribus here, this is Latin for other things being equal or other things being held constant. So here we where we imagine that all the non-price factors that could affect the quantity demanded are held frozen. They're held constant or unchanging. So demand means the maximum quantities of X that a buyer or seller is willing and able to purchase at various corresponding prices over some time period. So for example, uh, we could be talking about this, the maximum quantities of kebabs that consumers are willing and able to purchase at various corresponding prices in a day. Again, caterus paribus. So imagining that all of the non-price factors which could affect the quantity of kebabs demanded are held constant. So things like, for example, buyers' tastes and incomes. So we assume their tastes and incomes don't change momentarily. And we assume that the prices of substitutes for kebabs don't change. And the prices of complementary goods for kebabs don't change either. Another example might be this. The maximum quantities of unskilled labour that firms are willing and able to hire at various corresponding wages in a month. So... Caterus paribus again, imagining, for example, that all of the non-price factors, all of the non-wage factors that affect the demand quantity of labour demanded are held constant, such as workers' productivity is held constant or the price of the goods being produced by the workers is being held constant. Or another example might be the maximum quantities of Australian dollars that firms and households are willing and able to purchase at various corresponding exchange rates in a week. So again, caterus paribus. So assuming the non-exchange rate factors that might affect the demand for Australian dollars are being held constant, such as demand for Australian exports or the desire to invest in Australia. So just to be clear about this uh, definition, although I've given some examples where we fill in the definition with some particular content, let's focus now on this idea of the uh, various quantities and corresponding prices. So let's take an example. With We'll stick with our example of kebabs. So let's say we've got demand here means what? It means the maximum quantities of kebabs that in a day 
that buyers are willing and able to purchase at various corresponding prices. So we would say that if the price of kebabs were $10 per kebab, then a thousand kebabs would be purchased or would be demanded, not necessarily purchased, demanded. If the price of kebabs were $9, then 2,000 would be demanded. If the price of kebabs were $6, then 5,000 would be demanded, and so on and so forth. If the price of kebabs were $1, then 10,000 kebabs would be demanded daily. Obviously, this is hypothetical data. So, this table or schedule is what we call demand. It's not the quantity demanded. The quantity demanded is some particular quantity, such as, say, 5,000 kebabs when the price is $6. But demand per se is the entire table. It's all of these possibilities. If the price were 10, then the quantity demanded is 1,000. If the price were 4, then the quantity demanded is 7,000, and so on. The demand is the schedule, is all the possible quantities that buyers would be willing and able to purchase at the various prices. We could represent the schedule uh, graphically if we wanted to. There we go. In this example, we can see that something called the law of demand applies. The law of demand simply says that as the price of a good goes down, the quantity demanded goes up, assuming all other things remain constant, that is, cadres paribus. Or vice versa, the price of a good goes up, the quantity demanded decreases. Or, in other words, there is a negative or an inverse relationship between price and the quantity demanded. Caterus paribus, all other things remaining constant. So, the price of that we can see here in the graph that that's occurring. When the price of the good falls, the quantity demanded increases. When the price of the good rises, the quantity demanded decreases. That is, the quantity that the buyers are willing and able to purchase, the maximum quantity decreases. So when price changes, when we look at the graph, in graphical terms, when price changes, we move along an existing demand curve, where that demand curve assumes caterus paribus holds. That is, all of the non-price factors which could be affected in the quantity demanded are held constant. What if those factors were not held constant? What if there were non, the non-price factors that affect the quantity demanded change? Well, how do we represent that in a graph? Well, what we would say is, if we took the example of, it'll depend on what those factors are, will depend on the type of good you're looking at. So if we were to assume for example, that we were sticking with our kebab story, then we might say that as the um, income of kebab consumers goes up, um, assuming that the kebab buyers aren't already that wealthy, they'd be willing and able to buy more kebabs, whatever the price is. So if the price was $7, they'd be now willing to buy more kebabs. If the price was $6, they'd be willing to buy more kebabs. If the price were $5, they'd be willing to buy more kebabs. How do we represent this change? Given that we're, it's not talking about a change in price. Right? We're talking about a range of possible prices. What will demand be now at any of those prices? Well, we can say maybe it's higher if people's incomes rise, for example. We can represent it by shifting the demand curve to the right to show 
an increase in the quantity demanded at the same price levels as before, at all of the same prices as before. And vice versa, if, if uh, consumers' incomes fell substantially, then the demand curve would shift to the left to indicate that consumers at every price at every price level were now willing and able to buy less than before. Okay. Just a side note, um, must these demand curves be straight lines? Because I've just drawn straight line demand curves here. Well, the answer is no. In fact, you notice that I was, I'm using the term demand curves and their straight lines. Well, it, in economics, it's just a convention that even straight lines are called curves. Um, so, but no, they don't have to be straight lines. There's no reason why they have to be straight lines. I've just drawn straight lines because it happens to be convenient. It's easy to see what's going on. Must the demand curve always be downward sloping? Or in other words, must the law of demand always apply everywhere? The answer to that is no, but it is generally, generally regarded as unusual if the demand curve doesn't slope downwards. That is, if the law of demand were violated. That would be quite odd. But it's not inconceivable. I'm not going to go into the various uh, scenarios about why that would be the case, because uh, that's, that's a piece of exotica that we don't need to worry about now. But suffice to say, you can have a demand curve which looks like this. See, it's on a straight line. You could have a demand curve which looks like this, the vertical line, meaning that there's a certain quantity demanded, irrespective of the price. The price is $2, the quantity demanded is 5 If the price is $6, the quantity demanded is 5 If the price is $10, the quantity demanded is 5 That's conceivable. It's also possible to have a demand curve that looks like that, which is a little bit wonky. It's even possible to have a demand curve which is upward sloping. Or a demand curve which was backward bending. So these are all theoretical possibilities. Normally we don't find them empirically to be the case uh, that often. Anyway, most of the time in your textbooks you will find that everyone assumes a downward sloping demand curve where the law of demand applies. When price falls, the quantity demanded increases. When price increases, the quantity demanded falls. Caterus paribus. Okay, that's demand. What about supply? Well, the, the general definition of supply is the maximum quantities of X, whatever X happens to be, that sellers are willing and able to offer for sale in the market at various corresponding prices in some time period. Again, caterus paribus. That is, imagining that all of the non-price factors that could affect the quantity supplied are being held constant or are unchanged. So, again, to take an example, here we have the various maximum quantities of kebabs that sellers are willing and able to supply to the market at various prices per kebab. We can see it's represented here in a schedule, just like in the demand, in the case of demand. So schedule, supply means the entire schedule. The quantity supplied at any given price might be, say, 6,000 for $6, or 4,000 is supplied or offered for sale if the price is $4. These are the quantities supplied at a given moment, but supply per se is all of the possibilities together, the entire schedule. Again, we can represent 
the schedule graphically. So if we plug that into uh, an Excel spreadsheet and get a graph, there we go. We can see in this particular example, we've got an upward sloping supply curve. So when we have an upward sloping supply curve like this, where when the price falls, the quantity that the sellers are willing and able to offer for sale falls, or vice versa, when the price rises, the quantities, the maximum quantities that sellers are willing and able to offer to, for sale goes up. When that law of, when we see that relationship, we say that there, this is the law of supply in operation. Again, remember that when the price is changing, we move along the supply curve. And the law of supply says that when the price of a good goes up, the maximum quantities that the sellers are willing and able to offer for sale goes up and vice versa. Or in other words, there's a positive or a direct relationship between the price of the good and the quantity that the sellers are willing and able to offer for sale. Again, Caterus Paribus, assuming all other non-price factors are being held constant. What if they weren't being held constant? What if those non-price factors were to be changing? How do we represent that graphically? Well, let's say, for example, we were sticking with our kebab example, and we found that the wages that had to be paid to workers in kebab shops fell. In that case, we might say that firms would be willing and able to supply more to the market at the same prices as before, whatever that price happen, whatever those prices happen to be. So, for example, if the price was seven dollars, well, sorry, five dollars, they're willing and able to supply more than before. If the price was six dollars, they'd be willing and able to supply more. If the price was seven dollars, they're willing and able to supply more. In which case, we've got, we would represent this by shifting the supply curve to the right. And correspondingly, if we had uh, a decrease in the costs of production for all the firms in the market, or all the suppliers in the market, then kebab shop owners, then firms would be willing and able to supply less to the market at the same price as before. And we would represent that by shifting the supply curve back to the left again. Again, must the supply curves be straight lines? No. They don't have to be straight lines. Must the law of supply always apply? No. It doesn't. Uh, this is a bit less unusual than a violation of the law of demand. Um, you can have supply curves which are vertical, supply curves which are horizontal, supply curves which are downward sloping, even supply curves which are backward bending, like this. So you can get all sorts of weird and wacky shapes with the supply curves. And there are scenarios in which this is not inconceivable. Uh, it's not exactly the same as the law of demand, where it's very hard to find real-world examples. It's easier to find examples in the real world of violations of the law of supply. But, from here on, I'm going to assume those cases away, and we'll just have an upward-sloping supply curve just to illustrate the point that we need to make. Okay, so we've got our background now. We've got, we know about the basics of demand curves, and we know the basics of supply curves. So let's go on from here. Now if we put 
the demand curve and the supply curve together on the one Cartesian plane, we can come up with an explanation for price and quantity determination in a competitive market. So let's see how that story would work. And really, this is the point to the whole video, in a sense. Everything else was just a, an exciting lead-in. Imagine, so we've got our demand curve downward sloping, and we've got our supply curve upward sloping. So the law of demand is in effect, and the law of supply is in effect, fine. Let's imagine that the price of the product or service uh, that could be exchanged in this market is set at P1 for some reason. Now, at that price, we can find the maximum quantity that buyers are willing and able to demand and the maximum quantity that sellers are willing and able to supply, given by the demand and the supply curves. So the quantity demanded, given by the demand curve, is here. And the quantity supplied is higher. So we say that, so at that price of P1, the, the buyers say, at that high price, we're not really, I'm not really willing to buy that much. Meanwhile, sellers say, at that high price, we'd be willing to offer heaps for sale in the marketplace. So here we have a problem. And that problem is that the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. Sorry, the quantity supplied to the market is greater than the quantity demanded. So we have a surplus. We have an oversupply. So what happens when we have an oversupply? In that case, we would say that the sellers will start cutting prices to try and get rid of their surplus. So they cut their prices. Prices fall to P2, let's say. The quantity demanded will now be a bit higher because at a lower price, consumers are willing and able to buy more. But the quantity supplied, the new quantity supplied, will now be less because at lower prices, but the sellers aren't willing to offer as much. But there's still an oversupply, there's still a surplus. The quantity supplied is still greater than the quantity demanded. In which case, the sellers cut their prices again. The quantity demanded rises and the quantity supplied contracts, but still there's an oversupply, there's a surplus. Because that there's that surplus, the sellers cut their prices to try and get rid of their surplus stock. They cut their prices again until they get to this point here. Sellers have cut their prices to the point where now the quantity demanded as given by the demand curve is precisely the same amount as the quantity supplied as given by the supply curve. Now there is no surplus. There is no oversupply anymore. Is there any incentive on the part of the sellers to cut prices further? No. So we say that the prices have fallen until they now come to rest. They've reached an equilibrium. Equilibrium here just means coming to rest. What if, on the other hand, prices were very low? Let's say prices were at P1 here. In this case, the at the price of P1, the quantity supplied, because it's so low, the quantity supplied is very low. Sellers say at that low price, we're not willing to offer much for sale. Meanwhile, buyers say at that bargain basement price of P1, we're willing to purchase a lot of this stock, of this product. So the quantity demanded is far greater than the quantity that's supplied to the market. So we have a shortage. There's excess demand. And when we have that excess demand, 
what tends to happen? The buyers will start to bid the price up. Those who have missed out will start to bid the price up to, to try and acquire some of the uh, limited amount that has been supplied. So prices get bid up to, say, P2. The quantity supplied increases, but, as per the law of demand, the quantity demanded contracts. But not so far as to completely eliminate the shortage. That is, the quantity demanded is still greater than the quantity supplied, so buyers continue to bid the price up. Price rises again. Again, the quantity supplied increases and the quantity demanded decreases. But there is still a shortage. When there's a shortage, the buyers continue to bid the price up. Until the buyers bid the price up to a level where the quantity demanded by the buyers is precisely equal to the quantity supplied by the sellers. Is there any incentive on the part of the buyers to bid the price up any further? No. At which case, the price will come to rest. It will cease rising. It will come to rest. We say that the price will reach an equilibrium. So we call this the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. And we say if the market is free to operate in this way, then it will always gravitate towards this equilibrium. And given sufficient time, it will reach that equilibrium point and we will have an explanation for the price of any good or service. Assuming we're talking about, again, assuming we're talking about a purely competitive or a perfectly competitive market. Okay, so let's just do that one more time to let it sink in and then we'll finish up. In this case, let's say that the uh, supply of the product or the good is fixed in quantity. That is, we'll draw it, we'll use an, uh, a vertical supply curve to represent that idea. So no matter what the price is, no matter how high the price goes or how low the price goes, the quantity that's supplied to the market let's say it's fixed at QS, whatever that happens to be. So, if the price were P1, then we can see that the quantity supplied is unchanged from QS, but the quantity demanded will be QD, in which case the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied, and we have a shortage. And when we have a shortage, Buyers will bid the price upwards until the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. We reach an equilibrium price. If, on the other hand, the price were at P2, then we can see that the quantity supplied, again, is the same, it's fixed, but the quantity demanded would be lower, in which case we would say there is a surplus or an oversupply in this particular case. When we have that oversupply, the price can be cut until we reach an equilibrium again. So we gravitate, as we said before, we gravitate towards the equilibrium point and this, given sufficient time, explains in this case, the price that will prevail in the marketplace. Lucky last, just a quick comment on the limitations of this model. Some obvious limitations, we're not going to talk about anything particularly earth shattering or radical here. Um, the model is not particularly uh, useful if the participants in the market possess market power. If the participants in the market possess market power, then they have the capacity to influence the price to their own advantage. They can change the price as they see fit. In which case, 
the demand supply curve model isn't necessarily going to work. In particular, the supply curve might not you might not be able to draw a supply curve. Uh, I'm not going to go into why that would be the case, but you can ask your lecturer about that. It's also not a very useful model if the caterus paribus clause can't be satisfied. Remember the caterus paribus clause. So this applied to the definition of demand. Remember, its demand is the maximum quantities that buyers are willing and able to purchase at various prices, assuming all other non-price factors are held constant. And in the case of supply, the maximum quantities that sellers are willing and able to offer for sale in the marketplace at various prices, assuming non-price factors are held constant. Now, the models are not a very good one if, when prices change, that causes the demand curve or the supply curve to shift simultaneously. So, if prices affect people's incomes, their money incomes, then not only does the price change, so you would be moving along the demand curve, but the demand curve will simultaneously shift. So it's not uh, a very good model in that case. Or if price is taken as an indicator of quality. So the price, the change in the price, changes consumers' preferences about the nature of the product that they're buying. In that case, uh, it's questionable whether you can draw a demand curve. Because the demand curve is premised on the idea that the consumer maintains their perception of the nature of the product that they could conceivably be buying, um, irrespective of what the price is. Prices might also affect expectations, which could cause demand or supply to shift. And prices might affect tastes as well. So if prices go up, some people like to buy a product because it's more expensive. Um, their tastes change because they perceive the product as being uh, more desirable now than before. Uh, and this might be called a snob effect. Anyway, uh, that's pretty much it uh, for my summary of the bare bones of the, the mechanics of a basic supply-demand curve model. Hopefully this has been useful to you. If it hasn't, then... Um, Sad day for you, but you can ask your lecturer or your tutor about anything that doesn't make sense to you. Anyway, have a good day. Bye.